just better with sunshine. <laughs> I just, anyway, we sure are glad that you're here. If you happen to be here for the very first time, if you would take your bulletin, there's a little tear off section there. If you would take that and fill that out and either place that in the offering plate as it goes by or just give that to one of the ushers at the back, that'd be great. We sure are glad that you're here. Make sure you take your bulletin. A lot of stuff coming up over the next, actually several months, but just a couple of quick things. A week from Tuesday, you guys say Tuesday week, we're going to have a special thing here. Everything in here is special, but Trudy Cathy, who happens to be the daughter of Truett Cathy, who started Chick-fil-A, is actually going to be here speaking. So that's going to be on Tuesday, a week from this Tuesday. Uh, also coming up uh, on the 24th, Sunday, 24th right here, over there, we're going to have a business meeting. Also coming up on March the 22nd, on Friday, Equipping the Church and Home. If you still haven't signed up for that, but would like to be a part of that, you can stop by our information center and sign up there. Also, Young at Heart, luncheon, Tuesday. You don't want to miss that. Tonight at 6.30, we got all kinds of stuff going on. we got something for everybody. Over in the chapel, Dr. Williams is going to be preaching, interpreting the Gospels. So we look forward to seeing you again tonight. Good morning, Roebuck Baptist Church, and good morning, Roebuck parents. I'm Stephen Watson, and I am looking forward to being with you on Friday evening as we talk about family worship. And I don't want you to let those two words, family worship, scare you. What we're talking about is how to have conversations with our children in our homes about the gospel and about Jesus Christ. And I don't believe there's any greater responsibility for us as parents in telling our children about Jesus and how to follow Jesus as his disciples. So I want to invite you to come. I really want to challenge you to come. Be a part of this one evening of being equipped as a parent to have family worship, to have gospel conversations in your home with your children. I'm looking forward to being with you. I think it's going to be a great evening. I hope that you'll come and join us. Lord bless you. You guys have a great day of worship. Take care. All right. Thank you, Stephen Watson. And it's great to see you this morning. And I would encourage all of you who are parents uh, to consider coming this Friday night, uh, 630 to 9. It'll be a great time, a great event. You'll learn a lot. You'll grow, be challenged. So I encourage you to be a part of that. If you have any questions, please see Rebecca Robertson or Jordan Nates for equipping the church and home. All right, we're gonna have at this time uh, our, our welcome time and our, our greeting time. We have a custom in our church of, of having a time of greeting as we begin, and we're gonna do that in just a moment. Our worship team, led by David Satterwhite and our choir, are gonna lead us in our first worship song, and there'll be a time during the song when Dave will uh, encourage us, instruct us to, to greet people that are nearby. So in order for us to be prepared for that, if you can, I wanna ask you to stand. So let's stand at this time as we begin our worship.
us so much. This verse is what it's all about. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's Christianity, guys. That's what we come here and talk about every week. We talk about how I don't deserve what God has given me, but he has given me so much. He, Jesus Christ, is my Messiah. He's the one who has saved. He is the one who has delivered us. Amen? That's what we want to remember. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing.
you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. Let us pray. God, who is man that you are mindful of him? God, that you look down on us and you love us. God, and you ultimately showed that love through sending him who knew no sin to become sin so that we may be made alive in you. God, you took on what was temporary so that we could experience what was eternal. Lord, and I thank you so much for that. God, that is the greatest gift that any of us could ever have. And so, Lord, as we continue in this service, God, I pray that the gospel would be at the forefront of everything that we do. Everything we think about, everything we sing about, everything that is preached. God, I pray that the gospel would be at the forefront so that as we go out, it would be the forefront of our lives. Lord, we love you, and we pray all of this in your name. Amen.
Jesus, I've forgotten the words that you have spoken, promises that burn within my heart have now grown dim with a doubting heart I follow the paths of earthly wisdom forgive me for my unbelief renew the fire again Lord have mercy Christ have mercy Lord have mercy on me Lord have mercy Christ have mercy Lord have mercy on me I have built an altar where I've worshipped things of man. I have taken journeys that have drawn me far from you. Now I am returning to your mercies ever flowing. Pardon my transgressions. Help me love you again. I want us to pray, and then I'll let the kids go. I know you're supposed to go. I want us to pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the choir's song, because that is one of the greatest prayers that any of us could ever pray. And the greatest thing about that is that you will answer that prayer. And I pray right now that you would have mercy on me and that you would have mercy on us 
and that you would be glorified in our midst in all that we do. We don't deserve it. We never will. But you give it. You are the God of mercy, the God of loving kindness, the God of grace, the God of love. And we thank you and we praise you. And we ask again that you would have mercy on us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Now the kids, kindergarten through fourth grade, if you'd follow Mr. Chad for children's worship. And some of the parents are saying, yes, God does have mercy. So there you go. And I just want to mention, we already prayed, but please pray for the family of Renee Drew, one of our church members who lost her father. And his service will be uh, this afternoon at Mount Calvary Presbyterian Church at 3 o'clock. So please remember that family. And also the family of Scott Jackson. Scott is just clinging to life, basically being kept alive by a heart pump in Charlotte. And uh, it won't be long for him. So please remember the Jackson family as well. Thank you. If you would, please stand as we read God's word. We're going to continue the story of Gideon. After all the success, we're going to see what happens. Judges 8, 22 through 29. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Yet Gideon said to them, I would request of you that each of you give me an earring from his spoil. For they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They said, We will surely give them. So they spread out a garment, and every one of them threw an earring from their, from their spoil. The weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple robes which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the neckbands that were on their camel's neck, Gideon made it into an ephod and placed it in his city, Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot with it, with it there, so that it became a snare to Gideon and his household. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dina. Appreciate that so much. Well, I want to begin today by just letting you know something that you've probably heard other preachers say, and I'm sure some of them had a similar intent as I do, but it's this, very simple, God wants you to succeed. God wants you to succeed. Now, having said that, And you're thinking, well, I've heard a lot of TV preachers say the same thing, so I'm not copying them. I'm just telling you the truth. He does. But having said that, I have a second premise, and it's this. Our culture and some preachers don't understand what success really is. And that's that's one of the great issues for our culture. And a great example of that, and I don't want to pile on, but a great example of that is what came out in the news this week in this incredible academic scandal that I heard Alan Dershowitz call the greatest academic scandal in the history of America. I don't know if it'll prove to be that, but it certainly sounds like it might. And if you don't know about it, I don't know all the details either, but the bottom line is there were very, some very successful, um, worldly successful parents who have a lot of money and influence, and they use that money and of course, this is something that's always been done, but apparently they used it in a fraudulent way, in a deceptive way, in an effort to get their kids, their college-age kids, into the particular elite colleges that they wanted them to go to. And the FBI has been following this, and I think they, they made maybe a couple, 300 arrests, and there were some well-known celebrities that were involved, and you heard all about it. And as I thought about that, I thought this is a glaring example of what what we see when we say we want God wants us to have success or we want to have success, we misunderstand what success is. So I asked the question, why did the parents do what they did? And I asked the smartest person I know to give me an answer to that, and Ryan told me why they did it. And so I'm going to tell you what she said, but I really think there are two major reasons. And I think the first is, as a good parent, as a hopeful parent, as an optimistic parent, You always want the best for your kids. I understand that. I do. I want the best for my kids. I still do. I want the best for my grandkids. That's just how parents are. So I can understand that. So they wanted to do whatever they could to help their kid get a leg up on that climb, the ladder to success, climbing that ladder. And so that had to be a motivation. But then the second thing is, and this is what Ryan said, and the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, she's probably, that's probably the main thing. The second thing is, that they wanted to appear to be successful parents. And one of the ways you can appear to be a successful parent is when you say to your friends, hey, Johnny got into Harvard. And your friends go, wow, you must be an awesome parent. And so there's this, there's this tension here. I want something good for my kids, but don't I also want to be thought of as, hey, wow, you've got to be a great parent. Your kid got into Harvard or Yale or wherever it was. And so I thought about that, and I thought about this cultural thing. As we think about what success is, I think we're just, we just got a twisted perspective. We don't really understand what success is. Now, here's the thing. Our culture's confused about success, but that's nothing new. We see it, listen, we see it all through the Bible. From the Garden of Eden right on through, we see this confusion about what it is to be successful and what it is to be significant and what it means to be what the world, what what we think the world wants us to be. And we just wrestle and grapple with this all through life and we never get there. We never, ever get there. And the great example of that is the first billionaire in American culture was probably the oil magnate uh, J. Paul Getty. And they asked him one time, he he was the first billionaire. He was a billionaire in the 1930s. I mean, most of us don't get to be billionaires until much later, right? So anyway, they asked him, they said, how much money is enough? And his answer, a little bit more. A little bit more. It's never enough. And so we come to this passage as we wrap up the story of Gideon in this this part of of Judges and our theme of uh, 
uh, living by grace against the grain, this 300-year episode in the history of Israel, 300-plus year episode in the history of Israel that just sees the people time after time after time going through this repeated cycle of having to, you know, being under judgment because of their sin and, and God allowing the Philistines, the Midianites, whoever it is, to oppress them and then they cry out to God in despair or God hears and sees their sorry state and he raises up a deliverer, he raises up a warrior, he raises up a judge, and in this case Gideon, to be their champion. And then God uses that, that human being, that human instrument, to lead the people back to victory and back into position, and then the, the cycle repeats itself again and again and again. And so here's Gideon. We've had two weeks on him. This is the last week on Gideon. And in the aftermath of his valiant military achievement, the people come to Gideon, and they want to make him king. And Gideon has the highest moment in his life and the lowest moment in his life right here in the span of these few verses. When they come to him and they say, we want you to rule over us, we want your son to rule over us, we want your grandson to rule over us, and Gideon says, I will not rule over you, for God will rule over you. And we go, wow, what a great perspective, what a great insight. But then he turns around and says, well, if you don't mind, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate it if you gave me a little bit of spoil from the victory here and Everybody give me a little gold earring, and they do. And um, one estimate is that the, that the value of what they gave him was, would have been today over a half a million dollars, that the weight of the gold would have been 40 to 75 pounds, depending on which kind of gold it was. And he uses that then to make an ephod, which was something that was supposed to be worn. It was a garment supposed to be worn only by the high priest. And he made it. It seems like it becomes like an idol. And it says that as a result of that, that the nation played the harlot and they worshiped other gods. And then the saddest part, as, as, it, as we think about Gideon, it says that it also became a snare to Gideon and his household. And so what I want to talk about for just a few minutes is the snare of success. Because I do believe that God wants you and he wants me to be successful, but I don't believe that our culture has any clue what God's success really is. So I want to look at just two things from the passage. I want to talk first of all about the snare of power. And we see it in these two verses when the people come to Gideon and say, we want you to rule over us. You've delivered us from the hand of many. And Gideon says, I won't. My, I won't rule over you. My son won't rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. You know, history is replete with the story of tyrant after tyrant, who has come along and, and given this idea that, hey, everybody follow me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make everything right. Everything's going to be great. We're going to conquer the world. You go all the way back to the ancient history to people like Alexander the Great, and you go right on up through modern history to people like Hitler and Stalin and others. And there's this idea that when you get a little bit of power, that that's a good thing, and then when you get a little bit more power, that's a better thing. And then when you get to the place where you can have ultimate power, that's an even better thing. Therefore, the dictum of Lord Acton of Britain was power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I think it's admirable of Gideon that he, he, resent, he, he refused that. He rejected that. And see, here's the problem. The, the, uh, the people of Israel, they didn't have the authority to do this. Israel, not like the United States of America... Israel was a theocracy. The United States of America is a democratic republic. Not everybody in Israel had a vote. God did rule over, over Israel. Gideon was exactly right. That's the way it was set up to be. Now, of course, you get into 1 Samuel, and you're going to come to the point when God, he basically says to Samuel, hey, they've rejected me, not you. Let them have a king. And that didn't, that didn't always work out so well. But in this point, at this point, they didn't have the right to do this. So these, this group of people, probably leaders, probably military leaders and others, they come to Gideon and they say, Hey man, you, you led us to victory. We want to make you king. Now what's the problem there? Well, the problem is, go back to where we started. Two weeks ago, Gideon's down in the wine press, hiding from the Midianites, fearful for his life. Uh, Israel is just being completely subjugated to these people. They've been, have been dominated for years. And God calls him a valiant warrior, and he calls him out, and he says, I'll give you the power, I'll give you the strength. And then Gideon still questions him, he shows him, he devours, God devours his, 
his uh, sacrifice by fire. And that's still not enough. And Gideon has this test of the fleece, and he puts the fleece out one night, wants it to be wet and the ground dry, and vice versa. I think I got it confused. But bottom line is, he had a hard time, but God kept saying to him, I'll be with you. I'll see to it that you win. And then when he wins, the people of Israel just say, hey man, thanks for, thanks for leading us to victory. We want you to rule over us. And this is, the, this is one of the most oldest tendencies of our sinful hearts is to put people on pedestals that they can't, they, can't, they can't stand on. And it happens in business. It happens in politics. It happens in the church. And we've got to always remember who's in charge. God's in charge. God is seated on his throne. He rules over the universe. He always has. He always will. We're going to come and go. Kings, presidents, leaders, pastors, business leaders, J. Paul Gettys, they're going to come and go, but God stays the same. He rules, he reigns. No one can move God off of his position as rightful king of kings and lord of lords. Now, I know sometimes I watch a lot of sports, and did y'all know that? I watch sports, and sometimes at the end of the games, the, the team wins. <laughs> Ryan and I were listening to a, a, an interview yesterday on the radio. I can't even remember who it was, but he was talking. All, he made a big shot in, in the big game, and he's talking. About, he talked about everything, and he'd been talking faster than me for two. Well, it seemed like two minutes, and finally he goes, "We just got to give all glory to God." And I thought, "Man, thanks for getting that in there." Well, the, Midian, the, the Israelites don't get it in there at all. And I, I guess what I'm saying is, I understand it can sound a little cheesy. I'm grateful for that brother for saying, "Oh." Yeah, I made that jump shot. It was big, big, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and we've got to give all the glory to God. But at least he said it. There's not, not a word in here. In this whole chapter, there's not a word of gratitude to God for what he's done. It's all, we did it. Gideon led us. We, we got, the, we, the, to the victor goes the spoils. We got the spoils. We got it all. No indication that God gets any credit. And that's what happens. It's never wrong to give glory to God and it's always presumptuous not to. Listen, we wouldn't be here today. I, the choir song, Lord have mercy. With, without the mercy of God, Jeremiah said in Lamentations, we'd all be destroyed. We're only here by the grace and mercy of God. That's it. But we are here by the grace and mercy of God. So thank God. Praise God. Well, this is a significant passage, and Gideon understood, and he says, I'm not going to rule over you. My sons aren't going to rule over you because the Lord will rule over you. Great perspective. Uh, one guy called it the high point in his life, and it was. If only he had stopped there. He was, he was concerned. He, he was cautious about the sway, the snare of power. But then he fell into something else, and that's the second thing we want to look at, is the snare of idolatry. In the snare of idolatry, you see the passage. He says in verse 24, I would request of you that each of you give me an earring from his spoil. They gave him, they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They said, well, surely, we'll give you one. So they spread out a garment, and everyone threw an earring in there from his spoil, the weight of which was 1,700 shekels of gold, and also... The crescent ornaments, the pendants, the purple robes, which are the kings that belong to the kings of Midian. And besides these, the neck bands are on their camel's necks. And Gideon took it all, made it into an ephod, and he placed it in his city, Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot with it there, so they became a snare to Gideon and to his household. Uh, I, <laughs> one of my all-time favorite stories is about our 30th president. So you all know who our 30th president was. No, you don't. It was Calvin Coolidge. I Googled Calvin Coolidge. He came in fifth in the list of Calvins. Um, there was, let me see, I write them down. Calvin Klein came in first. Calvin Harris. I had to look, who, I didn't know who he was. And then Calvin and Hobbes, the comic strip. Calvin Harris, I think, is a singer. And then Calvin Coolidge, 30th president. Calvin Coolidge is the most, the thing that made him, he actually... He actually became president and didn't know he was president. The, the president that preceded him died, and he was up at his farm in New Hampshire or Maine or wherever it was. And back in those days, it was a little harder to get community. He was president. The president was dead for over a week before Calvin Coolidge found out he was president. But anyway, he was notorious for not saying very much. He wouldn't have made a good Baptist preacher. 
In fact, he was, he was so notorious for it. There's a famous story. It's probably not true, but I'm going to tell it anyway, about this some kind of gathering at the White House, and all these dignitaries were there. And two of the wives, two of the women, were talking about the fact that President Coolidge wasn't much for speaking, that he didn't say much, and they got in a little argument. Finally, one of them made a wager and said, I'll bet you $100 that I can get the president to say three words. And the lady said, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take that bet. So somehow this lady got in position to speak to the president, and she just got right to the point. She came up to him and said, Mr. President, I have a bet with a friend that I can get you to say three words. And President Coolidge said, you lose. <laughs> I love that story. But there's a quote from Calvin Coolidge that has some biblical principle behind it. He said, I've never been hurt by anything I did not say. And I could, I could spend all morning just talking about the verses in Proverbs. Proverbs 10, 19 says, Where there, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. There's verse after verse after verse like this. There are verses in the New Testament that talk about it, that we need to be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. All those, kind, all those uh, admonitions of Scripture remind us that we need to be careful about what we say. I love this little adage. If your mind goes blank, be sure to turn off the sound. And that's a good adage for pastors. I, I heard another one said in preaching, uh, if you've been drilling for 20 minutes and you haven't struck oil, it's time to stop boring. Cruel, right? Yeah. Well, the bottom line, is, oh, this is a good one too. It's better to sit quietly and have people question your intelligence than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. So... There you go. And I'm a big talker. I can't shut up. You know that. Well, anyway, the bottom line is what happens here is Gideon says the right thing when he says, I'm not going to rule over you. My son's not going to rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And then there's this three-letter well, three word. Yet, in the very next verse, he says in verse 24, Yet, Gideon said to them, I would request something of you. As I thought about that, I thought, how many times in my life have I said the right thing, and if I just shut up then, everything would have been great. And then there comes a yet, or a but, or a and, an and. It's, when it's time to be quiet, it's time to be quiet. I wish Gideon had just kept quiet, but he didn't. And as a result, he turns from the highest moment of his life to the lowest. One man said the final chapter of Gideon's life appears as a distinct anticlimax to the heroic actions of his earlier chapters. And he says, Gideon, who came through the test of adversity with flying colors, was not the first nor the last to be less successful in the test of prosperity. In fact, James Dobson says that adversity is easy, an easier test than prosperity. And that Thomas Carlyle said, for every 100 people who can stand the test of adversity, only one can stand the test of prosperity. Why? Because when we become prosperous, we start thinking, man, I'm pretty good here. I've got money, I've got wealth, I've got prestige, I've got position. Whatever it is, I'm just doing great. And we forget God. So the test of prosperity can be a challenge. What this reminds me of, this story reminds me of the story in, in 2 Kings chapter 5 when Naaman... The, uh, the Syrian general is covered with leprosy. The servant girl from the northern kingdom of Israel who's been cap captured by his country says to him, if you, could go to, to my, if you could go to the prophet in Israel, he could heal you. He goes to Elisha, and Elisha tells him to bathe seven times in the Jordan River. You remember that story? And he gets offended, and he says, in that muddy river, we have many rivers in our country that's much better than this. He said, I'm not going to do it. And then his servants say to him, my master, if, he had, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Then why not do this simple thing? So Naaman bathes seven times in the Jordan River, and he comes up, and his leprous skin is perfectly clean. And then as a powerful man, a prestigious man, a wealthy man, he wants to honor the prophet, and he offers to pay him. And Elisha says, no, I'll take nothing. And so Naaman says, okay, have it your way. And as he's leaving, Elisha's prophet, Gehazi, he just thinks, this is wrong. And let me read what he says. Verse 20, 2 Kings 5. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, behold, 
my master has spared this Naaman, the Aramean, by not receiving from his hands something that he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So this servant, Gehazi, just decides on his own, this isn't right. My master healed this man of leprosy. He's a powerful, wealthy man. I'm going to go chase him down and take something. I'll let him give me something. And you know the story. He gives him, he tells him a lie. He says these, these uh, uh, prophets in training have just arrived and we need food and clothing. He takes all this stuff back. And then Elisha just nails him when he comes back. He says, where have you been? And he lies again. And Elisha tells him, I saw you. I know exactly what you did. And from that moment on till his death, Gehazi was inflicted with the leprosy that had been on Naaman. And that's kind of what this sounds like. It's like, I, won't, I don't want to rule over you, but if you want to, you could give me a little gold here, a gold earring, uh, some pendants, some of the robes of the kings, whatever you want to throw in, it's fine. You know, nothing big, just whatever you want to do. And so the attitude of Gideon goes from being in the right frame of mind to being in the wrong frame, frame of mind. And he, he, he gets this stuff. They give him, they said, sure, they give him all this stuff. It, as I said, it weighed 40 to 75 pounds. It was valued at what would be about a half million dollars today. And then he takes it and he fashions it into this ephod, a golden ephod, which, as I said, would normally be something that would be worn by the priest. But there are two problems. He wouldn't wear a golden ephod. And the other problem is there were no priests in Ophrah where Gideon was. The priests were back in Shiloh. They were back where God had designated, where the tabernacle was stationed. That's where God had designated for the worship to go on. That's, that was God's design. That was God's plan. And Gideon made the mistake that many before him and many, many, many since then have made of deciding, you know, God won't mind if we just adjust his plan a little bit. God won't mind if we just add a little bit to it. Surely it'd be okay if we just set up a little war, an, an altar for worship here. It'll work out. It'll be fine. People can still go to the tabernacle back in Shiloh. The high priest can still do all the sacrifices there. But we can have our little side thing here. Everybody will understand. It. It'll work out great. Except it didn't. It didn't work out well at all. In fact, it says that the people played the harlot. That doesn't mean, I don't think this is a reference to sexual harlotry. In fact, one man said they committed spiritual prostitution. What did they do? They did the very thing that God said would happen by not driving out the pagan, de the pagan people and their deities. They began to worship other gods, even to the point that Gideon and his own family was ensnared by this same thing. Judges 2, 3, God said, The Canaanites will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. And they were. And so once again, we see failure in the book of Judges, but there's always mercy from God. And we'll see more of that in the days ahead. Well, here's the bottom line. Here's where we'll wrap up this morning. God wants you to succeed. He wants me to succeed. He wants all of his children to succeed, but not in the way that the world sees success. So here's the question, how do you know when you've really succeeded? Well, I shared a devotion at Upward Basketball this year that I'm going to kind of wrap up with this morning, and it has to do with Zion Williamson. And if you don't know who Zion Williamson is, you know, ask somebody. Ask anybody. I watch golf on television a lot. I've never heard golf announcers talk about basketball players until this year. Zion Williamson, I don't know his whole story, but he played for the Spartanburg Day School. I saw him play in high school. Some of you did too. I knew his high school coach, Lee Sarter. He and I are friends. In fact, I don't know much about Zion Williamson. He plays for Duke. He's, he's a huge, mass of humanity, incredibly talented, and incredibly good. He was the ACC Freshman of the Year. He was the ACC Player of the Year. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say he was the ACC Tournament MVP. If he wasn't, nobody was paying attention. He'll, he might be the national player of the year. Well, he, yeah, he, he could be all these things. And someday he might be the most valuable player in the NBA. He might be, in fact, who knows? He might become the greatest basketball player ever. I don't know. He's very, very talented. It's, it's freakish how talented he is and how big he is. And I was telling the people that day, and I'll tell you, some of you may know him. I've never met him. As I said, I do know his high school coach, and he seems like a really good kid. His high school coach told me that he was. And I pray that he is. I pray that he's a believer. I don't know that. 
but I pray that he is. But here's the thing. As great as he is, and as much as he's already accomplished, and as much as he may accomplish in the future, he's not a success unless he fulfills the purpose for which God made him. And what I told the group that day is this. God made Zion Williamson for something more important than basketball. He made Zion Williams more important for something much more important than basketball. And I love basketball. I love sports. But there's not a person anywhere, the greatest athlete, you know, in any sport, none of those guys or ladies were ever created just to be athletic champions. And you could put anything else in there, business leaders, politicians, preachers, whatever. God never made anyone just to do something to be called the greatest or to just achieve things that this world says are important. God has created every one of us, from Zion Williamson to me, everybody in between, he's created all of us for his purpose. That's why we're here. And if you come to the end of your life and you've accomplished all kind of worldly success, but you haven't fulfilled the purpose for which God made you, then you have not succeeded. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, put it this way. He said, it's not about you. The first paragraph of that book that sold over 30 million copies, which is unheard of in Christian book circles, he said, it's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. And then he said this, being successful and fulfilling your life's purpose are not at all the same issue. You could reach all your goals, become, become a raving success by the world's standards, and still miss the purposes for which God created you. And that's absolutely right. And that's what so many people do. So many people are shooting for these incredible goals and these incredible ambitions, and they get there, and it just doesn't do it. It just doesn't, it doesn't fulfill. It doesn't satisfy. Power, prosperity, idolatry, whatever. None of that's going to satisfy. It's not going to allow you to experience what God, what Jesus came to give you, the abundant life that only he can give. And so we should pray for Zion Williamson. He's bringing great, he's bringing great publicity to Spartanburg. He's from Spartanburg, South Carolina. And you'll hear about him again. They'll, they're probably going to keep on. They may win the national championship, and then he'll probably be the number one draft in the NBA and pick in the NBA, and he'll, he'll sign a multi, multi-million dollar contract. And good for him. But none of that really matters in terms of fulfilling his purpose. And it certainly doesn't matter fulfilling my purpose or yours. We need to make sure that that's our goal. That's our aim. That's how you're going to succeed. That's the only way. So real success is finding God's purpose for your life and then living your life for his glory. As Gideon said, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And as we think about our own lives, that needs to be true of us. Who's ruling over your life? Who's guiding your life? Who's king in your life? If the answer to that's anything but God, you're missing the point. You're missing the mark. And I don't want to see that happen. Give your life to Jesus. Let him lead you. And you'll find fulfillment. You'll find purpose. And that is true success. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you today for reminding us that success is not measured in how many victories we win, how many points we score, how much money we make, how many friends we have, how big our home is, our bank account, our retirement account, none of those things. The thing that really matters is are we walking with you? Are we fulfilling the purpose for which we have been made by you? Father, it's great to achieve in business, in school, in sports, music, art, politics. That's great, whatever. That's fine. You can use people and you do use people in all those areas for your glory. And I'm grateful for every one of them. But Father, help us to always remember we were made for something bigger than sports. We were made for something bigger than business. We were made for something bigger than politics. We were made for something bigger than education. We were made for something bigger 
then all those things put together, we were made for you. We were made to glorify you. And Father, I pray you would help me and help each one of us to do that and help the person who's here today who has never put his or her faith in Jesus to start today by professing faith and following the Lord Jesus so that he or she might have abundant life, meaningful, purposeful life, may never get written up in the paper, may never be heard about in the history books, but none of that matters. What matters is that we do what you've called us to do for your glory and your honor. Thank you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have our hymn of invitation and response. And as we do, I remind you that it's for everybody here. Everybody here. God made everybody here for a purpose. The purpose for which he made you is just as important as the purpose for which he made Zion Williamson or Donald Trump or Queen Elizabeth or whoever. God made you for a purpose. He wants you to live out your purpose for his glory and his honor. If you do that, you're a success. If you don't, you're not. Trust him. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, if you've never given your life to Jesus, do that. It's the most important thing about, about anything, making sure that you're in a right relationship with Jesus. Trust him. Admit your sin. Believe he's truly who the Bible says he is and commit your life to him. And come, make it public. Tell me, I'll tell the whole church. If you've never followed him in believer's baptism, come and do that. We look forward to having baptism real soon as we celebrate new life in Christ, as we celebrate identifying with Jesus, as we celebrate Jesus' death and burial and resurrection and, and the death, burial, and resurrection spiritually of the person who follows the Lord in baptism. Maybe God's leading you into the fellowship of this church. Maybe you just need to come for prayer. Whatever the case, we're not going to make this long. You come as God leads. I want you to stand. I'm going to be right here at the front. You follow the Lord's leadership.
I want to present uh, Matt and Katie Teal. Now, Katie is already, you know her. She grew up in our church. Her name was Katie Settlemeyer. And they got married how long ago? Eight months ago. Isn't that great? And so Matt and Katie came to talk to you. Matt's a professing Christian. He grew up in a church of another denomination that doesn't practice baptism the way that we do. So he's coming this morning, and Katie's coming for moral support presenting himself by membership for church, by, I'm sorry, for membership by baptism. And so we uh, want to welcome him. So if you would join in welcoming Matt and Katie. You, you prefer Matthew. Yes. Matthew and Katie, would you say amen? amen? And what I want you to do is after the service, I'll have them in the back. You come by and speak to them. And we'll look forward to having baptism real soon. Some of you need to do the same thing that Matthew just did this morning. And it's not really hard to do. Was that hard to do? Wasn't hard to do. You, you had to get around my son-in-law and the camera over there. So, yeah. But that's all. Well, that was the hardest thing you had to do. But anyway, we're happy to have them, and uh, we're grateful that God's brought them together and look forward to Matthew being a member of our church. All right. At this time, we're going to stand for our benediction. Let me encourage you to come tonight. Go ahead and stand. Tonight, we're over. If you're not in a, a discipleship group or something else, we're over in the chapel. And we're looking at the Gospels tonight. Let me ask you a question. Why do we have four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Isn't it the same story all four times? Well, come tonight. You'll find out. Look forward to that. So we'll be in the chapel for that, and the rest of you will be in the other places that you need to be. Joe Force is ready to pray. He's our deacon of the week. He'll have our benediction at this time. Let's pray. Uh, most gracious Heavenly Father, uh, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your love and kindness that you pour out on me. And Lord, I know that uh, the whole church echoes that, that you just pour it out on us each and every day. And Lord, I'm only successful because of you. Thank you so much, Lord. Uh, dear Lord, we've heard a great message today. And the question I ask, what's bigger than you? And Lord, I, I look at my life today and I still wonder, what's bigger than you, Lord? I've been a Christian for a long time. And Lord, I pray that we all look at that and uh, just get what's bigger than you out of our lives, Lord. Lord, thank you for the teals and them joining our church this morning. I pray that uh, they glorify you, and I pray that uh, we are great disciples to them. In Christ we pray, amen.